to our presentation this evening, uh, which is a presentation of the Contemporary Ukrainian Studies Program at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. Uh, we've had a very, very busy week, as you know, with the visit of President Poroshenko a week ago, and uh, we just had a symposium uh, yesterday honoring and uh, commemorating the 100th anniversary of the birth of Professor Ivan Lysiak-Rudinsky, a history professor who taught at the University of Alberta, had a very distinguished career, and uh, so we had a chance to examine his achievements, but also to launch the publication of his diaries, which just appeared in the uh, view, and we are working also as well on a publication of his correspondence, so his legacy uh, lives on. In connection with our seminar, our symposium, we invited uh, Yaroslav Fritzak and Sahit Loki, our guests tonight, to uh, participate in that, but also to take, to, to take, taking advantage of the fact that they're here to arrange another evening so they can meet with the community and uh, talk a bit about contemporary Ukraine from their perspective. So the basic uh, theme of tonight is Ukraine since the election of President Volodymyr Zelensky, but uh, we're going to take two different approaches to it. Professor Gritsak will discuss the question of whether Zelensky's April 2019 presidential victory could be considered the start of, the, of Ukraine's third Maidan, or whether a new Maidan can be expected at all. Professor Bokhi will address the question of why and how Ukraine became, became involved in the impeachment scandal in the U.S. and what this might signify for U.S.-Ukraine relations. I should point out they're kind of a pair because they were here in 1991 together when they were fresh, young, bright, bushy-tailed young scholars from Ukraine uh, out in the out, let loose in the West for the first time, among the first times they were out here. And uh, we had a wonderful time with them, but they have a long history with our institute that goes back to that time. Yaroslav has been here numerous times. He's collaborated with us on numerous projects in Ukraine, so he, of course, also worked at our institute for a number of years before Harvard stole them from us. And, uh, but we still talk on the phone and we maintain collegial relations with, uh, with Sahi. And uh, it's a delight to, to have them both here and a real pr pr privilege. Yaroslav Kritsak is a professor of history at the University of Ukraine Catholic University in Lviv. He is the author of numerous publications on the modern history of Ukraine, including a book of essays on the formation of the modern Ukrainian nation in the 19th and 20th centuries. Maris Historia Ukraine that came out in 2019. He also uh, just had recently published Ivan Kamko and his Community, which is a translation of an earlier book of his in English. It's now translated into English. So, Yaroslav, I turn it over to the Bulab, it is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Yars, for your kind presentation. And it's really a pleasure, a treat to be here. I've been here, it's hard to tell, it's a, exactly 29 years ago. Some people don't live that long. So every time they come to the, I came to Edmonton, there's like an, a nice and warm memo, memoirs, kind of nostalgia. So it's always a pleasure to be here. I'm going to address the issue which is uh, now we discuss in Ukraine. It's not the issue, it's an, an issue. It's very much present in public discourses. I wonder, I, I'm not sure whether you discuss it here, but probably most likely you do it, because it's quite evident. And the issue is the, the legacy of revolution, so to say. Legacy of two Maidan, specifically of the last Maidan, and the opportunities, exactly the, the new change of the country, the new power, new president. Everything has been changed. Everything has been changed. There is a semi joking there is a, has been initiative recently to rename Ukraine in the New Zealand country. If you see the irony, Z country, Zealand, so to say. But there is radical changes. But I believe there is less, very much superficial. Because underneath, underneath, there is something, tendency is still going on. And this is what I'm trying to address in my presentation. The issue is whether this was a third Maidan or should we expect another Maidan? This is what will be discussed in Ukraine. But let me start with digression with these two gentlemen. And if I may provide this 
give me some opportunity to provide my own short classification. I'm not a political scientist, so don't take it seriously. It's my own as a historian. I believe that each and one country, each, all countries could be divided into two large groups. Idiot proof countries and non idiot proof country. I mean, idiot proof, that means this kind of idiot as a, a modern meaning of the word idiot, but the, the foolish person, the person with low IQ, but in the original meaning of the word. Original meaning of the word is the person who, who is deviant in some other way, who has lacked some professional skills to keep this position, so to say. So, what I'm saying here that there's nowadays times so the they come to power, people who are, have no training, whatever, in the position that they have. They from some kind of other fields, and this is nowadays world phenomenon. And they could compare this country, there are a lot of them. But I believe the basic distinction is, is whether if such an idiot come to power, can, how much harm could he, could he or her done to the country? The issue is whether there's check and balances. So my point is that in some countries, there is institutions, and even there is a unbelievable idiot and do whatever he can so she can, still he, cannot, he or she cannot break this institution and the country is idiot proof. But unfortunately, there are other groups of country which is not idiot proof. And you know, some, some, some paradoxical way, power always attracts the deviant people and they come to power to such country, they do, could do a lot of harm. In my understanding, a very limited understanding, I believe that United States, like a Poland, is very much idiot proof country because there are some balances in institutions, they work. Whatever the institutions, like impeachment process, whatever, which is not the case in Ukraine. Because in Ukraine, there is no institutions. At least, at least there is no established institutions. And therefore, I believe that such a, uh, such a precedent, like a coming Zelensky to power, makes a specifically complicated case and also a case which is very dramatic, not to say. Not to say more. And this is, I believe, something which is nowadays is a world of the day, this kind of populism, with these people coming to power. And it will be hard, naively, to expect that Ukraine would avoid this fail, this, 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 this uh, wave of the populism. If you look on the country before 2015, 2018, Ukraine, all these perimeters were, on all the perimeters, the neighboring country were already populist country, be it Russia, Belarus, Poland, or Hungary, they always have some of different kind of the populism, which means Ukraine was like a single island among the large sea of the populism, so it would even expect that Ukraine would avoid this fight. Sooner or later, it would happen. The main question is what kind of populism is there, because populism is very kind of umbrella uh, concept, you have different kind of the populist within this, and this is something which is actually this, this also discussed because you could compare uh, Trump and Zelensky, Johnson and Zelensky, but still they're different. In a sense that they follow different rhetoric, and whatever you say about Zelensky, he is not conservative, he is not rightist, he is populist. So therefore it calls for kind of some explanation, what kind of the uh, uh, populist is him, and with specific Ukrainian con 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 context, since he came to power, after the first Maidan, after the second Maidan, there's kind of the recurrence here, some pattern. We had the same thing in 2009. But after the first Maidan, you have Yanukovych being elected as a president. And there are some similarities, even so superficial, but there are some similarities between uh, Zelensky and uh, Yanukovych. Both came more or less from the same region, industrial Russian speaking reasons. Bo more or less, they both attached to the oligarch system. So therefore, there was always has been some kind of fears, uh, strong fears that the, the presidential victory of Zelensky could be treated as some kind of the country revolution. My point is very simple. It's not a country, it's neither revolution nor country revolution. It's still be in the haze. But I would say that if you bet on a revolution, the chances are it's like a six to four. Seven to three, to five to five. And I've tried to explain why is that. So this is the issue of the revolution is still is not kind of very theoretical one. So first of all, let me just make myself, boast myself, 
I was one of men, sub, several analysts who predicted Maidan, second Maidan. This was my uh, interview in the 2012 when I just said that revolution is hanging in the air. It is must be issue of the next few months or years, whatever. But basically, it's, I'm not a historian. I'm a historian, not a kind of good as in, in prophecies, but there are very simple trick. And I will want to teach you the trick how to predict the revolution or the chances for revolution. And before I start with this, I have to co go into some, some the theories. They're rather simple. They are not that much complicated. Just want to make some simple points about the revolution. First of all, we have to take into account that what we experience nowadays in Ukraine, this shows now Ukraine, it's a world, world phenomenon, be, be it, be it uh, Occupy Wall Street or recent uh, protests in Hong Kong, they're more or less the same way of the, they're the same, the same events of the new wave of revolutions, which are rather, to say, very recent one. And uh, they, be, below, they belong to the different type of revolution that we used to know. Let's put this way, the typical, archetypical type of revolution that we refer to, historians, political analysts, is the Great Revolution, so-called Great French Revolution or Great Russian Revolution. Type is 1789, French Revolution, or 1917. Uh, we some quite often compare this kind of wave revolution, including Maidan to this revolution, and I believe this, this point of comparison is totally false. Because we now living in the another way, we have very distinctive. And this is a revolution of type which I call the 68-89, the Paris Revolution, the Student Revolution 68, and also the, the fall of the communist, communist uh, system, the fall of Berlin Wall, which has a kind of very distinctive features. There are three distinctive features, very important. First of all, it's a revolution of middle class. The basic social class that takes this revolution is a middle class, mostly younger middle class. It's a middle class and also generation, therefore we call it new middle class which is kind of different from the old middle class. So therefore, it's kind of the paradoxical, because we used to believe that revolution is only driven by the poorest classes. This is not. This is mostly classes which are relatively well established. They are main driving force for the revolution. Secondly, they tend to be rather peaceful, unlike these great revolutions. Uh, Timothy Gertner put it very nicely, that if the main symbol of the great revolutions were guillotine, the main symbol of the new type of revolutions is the round table. The negotiations by the very end, when they come, they change to the power. And the third and most probably important thing, they are very banal revolution. Say, so unlike this revolution, great revolution with the capital R, they with a regular R, which means they occur on a very frequent basis. Let's put this way, someone do this by a nice comparison. If the great revolution, the, the occurrence will be like an eclipse of the sun or, or, or moon, so once in 10, 20 years, this kind of revolution looks more like a traffic jam. It occurs on the very everyday basis. So having all this in mind, if you want to bet the revolution, you rather bet it because the chances of revolutions are much higher than expected, because they're banal. Some calculated in the 20th century, there were, say, two revolutions per year since the beginning of this century was at the four revolutions per year. And it could occur in any country. There's something new, which is still in this process, but still, there's something to be taken into account. How to predict the revolution? And this is kind of the trick which I was told by the social scientist, his name probably no. Uh, Escapes my mind to check on my mind. Uh, Johann Volovacher. He then came to Lviv and he actually predicted the, the first Maidan. He said basically that they were monitoring uh, public opinion in Ukraine since the beginning of the Ukrainian independence. And each year they keep repeating the same questions and they comparing the answers. And among these questions was a very simple one about the economic situation. So the question was whether your situation is better than worse in comparison with the previous year. And this answer was standard, worse and worse and worse and worse. But once they would be asked if they bought a car, an apartment, a computer, if they spent a summer vacation somewhere on the sea, the most likely the answer would be yes and yes and yes. And what they said basically, that they, not they were not lying in one case and tell the truth in another case, they were telling the truth in both cases. 
Because he, 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 here we have some new mechanism here. People take vacation, computer, apartment, car as a norm. Then you can see it as a symbol of the some standard. So what I mean here, the idea of the poverty is not absolute, but relative. They compare themselves to their neighbors, being these neighbors living in the street, on the city, but most likely in the neighboring country. If they look, they look, say, they stand living life poorer than in Russia or in Poland, they declare themselves that they are poor. And this is something, you say, this is the mechanism. Because the mechanism is, it's a expectations. Expectations getting higher and higher and higher. People are not satisfied with what they have. They want more. And once you have this kind of mechanism, you may expect some political turmoil. Specifically, and this is kind of another paradox, it's a, this situation, this expectations, expectations occur in the economic situation, the situation is getting better, not worse. Because there is a gap between what the economic is, because economic actually produce this kind of, provoke this kind of expectations, and uh, what people feel about themselves. This is the, the graph which was made by the, the economist a few years ago, which shall try to explain this mechanism. Here you have an Arab Spring. You see this, the GDP per capita. There is low race in the Arabic country, but the expectations are going low. And once you get this gap, you may expect a revolution. The gap is very important. And you have the same gap in the Ukrainian case. So this is something that not many people could understand. Because in the Ukrainian case, revolution occurs when the situation is getting better. Both 2004 and 2014, in economic terms, was rather good years. When the economy was on the rise, not on, on decline. I'll show you later. This GDP helps to show this kind of the, 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 the distance. So what I'm saying here, there is some deeper undercurrent which not quite taken into account when you're talking about Ukrainian situation. Because what they're discussing, the political changes, language issue, Bandera issue, historical memory kind of thing, which we like to discuss with humanitarians. But there are just very legitimate to do this, to discuss the thing. But there are some kind of current which are beneath, lying beneath, and they are not quite evident, but they could tell you something, what really is going into the country. So my guess is just probably very shortly, briefly, to say what is the most dramatic change in Ukraine, which is not that much discussed. And this is the change of the last 10, 15 years, and I believe the both first and specifically second Maidan was a part of these changes. First of all, there is dramatic change in the structure of the Ukrainian economy. You know the 20th century, to a large extent, was the age of the Soviet industrialization. Ukraine became industrialized. And the main focus on the industrialization was East, without a doubt, this region, which you know well, so nowadays, and this is the effect of the zero years, we have a change of the GDP structure, because a large segment of GDP nowadays produced not in industry, but post-industrial services, more and more so. Like IT, like education, restaurants, recreational kind of things. And this is, happens in every country. Ukraine was probably one of the last to enter this field, but this is something which is important. And also has a kind of impact on the regionalism in Ukraine. This is a map that I like very much. It maps that provides you with the uh, evaluation of economic activity in Ukraine. It's a photo picture taken from the, from the space in, during the night. And it assesses and evaluates the level of the lightning of the regions. Because basically, lightning during the night is the also tells you something about economic activity. So what you see here, this clear tendency, and this clear tendency which is very important before the Maidan, but still going on, I mean, especially um, nowadays even more evident after the, the, during the war, that you see this east is fading away, and central and west is getting lighter and lighter. So there is a, there is a new tendency nowadays that social capital and capital, just in general terms, is moving slowly but surely from the industrial east to center and to the west. What it means in many senses? It means exactly this emergence of the new middle class, which is not affiliated with the industry per se. 
with this kind of service, civil service, since it is emerging this middle class, you see the dynamics. This class is, is not a majority, but it's also not, not a minority, could not be ignored. Depending on different criteria, it could be just between, say, 10 and 40 persons. Again, it depends on the, 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 the absolute middle class or relative middle class. But it's, it's large, and you see the tendency, it's growing. But to revolution to occur, you have to have more than five factor. At least two factors have to occur for revolution to concur. First is the, this kind of the rise of the middle class, which is more related to this kind of the industrial change, post-national changes. And second, very important, that you have the same process in Russia, in probably more evident. We have a larger middle class. But you could hardly expect the revolution in, in Russia. And this is tell something about the, the second factor. There must be some kind of relative democracy. At least nobody had to have the control over mass media. Because if there is no control, there seems public space could exist and it's a public discussion. So basically, you have to have this kind of the relative middle class with relative democracy. When you have this combination of this factor, you may expect this kind of revolution like at the first Maidan or the second Maidan. It's a, not that much complicated. I'm sorry that probably it's going to, into details, but basically this is the process. If you get this process, it's, it's easier to understand, for me specifically, especially, what's going in Ukraine. So, on the one hand, it's a revolution, definitely. What happened with the presidential elections, actually there's many people said, and I'll say this is, this is, this is another third Maidan. Peaceful Maidan, election on Maidan. Because basically, you see here, one of the main criteria of revolution is the change of the political class. And political class has been changed, dramatically. There's a data, I don't have this data, but basically up to 70% of nowadays political class who are in the power, the people who are, had been in power five years ago. And also the, the age of these people, they're much younger, so in a sense could be told the younger revolu young, young, youth revolution, also the Thermaidan, political hurricane, whatever it is, but there is some feeling that this, there is a change there, and change is very radical. But this on the one hand, but on the other hand, there are some features of it which still are there. They persist. The old habits die hard. And there are structural. And I believe since they are there, there are still chances for a new Maidan. And I will just list these few factors and I will finish with this. First of all, the structure of power. You probably heard this kind of open access, limited access. So in the country which have open access, revolution are less likely to occur. Which is more democratic process, all the kind of things. Structural power, which is not the case in Ukraine, because still the ruling elite, it's very much organized on the same personal basis. It was to be the, the, the job that under Yanukovych, it was Donetsk, under uh, Poroshenko, it was Vinitsky, since Vinitsa. Nowadays, it's the Quartal. And most of the appointments on the crucial positions, the people are who are either friends or a godfather or godmother or friends or friends of Quartal, and still there is there. I would tell, this is my personal experience, this is probably the most, the more, the most closed power they've ever had. Because even under Yanukovych, have some leaks information. We knew what was going on. We had a kind of concept of this. Not like in this case. They are very close. It's very hard to understand what's going in, in between. There's some very strong discipline. And so they look very much democratic and think it's not really the case. They are very much closed. And I believe this is also tell you something. This is about limited access. And secondly, and correlated with this, is the level of concentration of power. We never knew, even Yanukovych didn't have this kind of level of concentration of power like Zelensky has, specifically in the parliament. There's practically no position. All the positions in the power are kept by his by his party, and he's still gathering, collecting this power. We know to, it, to which aim, but basically he claims that this, he, his role model is Lee Kuan Yew, Singapore, which means he tries to present himself as an as a enlightened, enlightened, enlightened dictator, modernizing dictator, who made this kind of reforms uh, along lines of the Singapore and Lee Kuan, Lee, Kuan, Lee Kuan Yew, which is hardly unlikely. Because first of all, Lee Kuan Yew was a, uh, Genius per se, could not compare. There is uh, somebody put it that for every uh, 
there's a myth of the modernizing dictator. For every hundred dictator, there's only one who is modernized, and it's Lee Kuan Yew. You have to really Lee Kuan Yew. Not just claim you're following Lee Kuan Yew. It's a probably, probably exception to build this. And secondly, if you look on the who are the, what are the country who has this kind of modernizing dictators, most likely they're not, more likely they're not the country of the, say, the Asian countries or Asian tigers with a kind of Confucian ethics, which, 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 which provides, provokes some kind of the, some kind of specific attitudes to the power, which means low level of protests, which is not the case in Ukraine. Ukraine are not Protestants, they are whatever they claim about themselves, Orthodox or Catholics, but Maidan is their solution, so to say. They, they leader, their role model is not Lee Kuan Yew, but probably Mahno in this sense. So you'd hardly have to have this kind of the chance for him to be a modernizing dictator, a very, a very, a very slim. So, uh, and so this is the political issues. The economical issues, probably the most reliable factor. The most reliable factor of the state of economy is the uh, level of the shadow economy. How much of the GDP is made in illegal, illegally in sphere. And this is, many historic economists say that if you want to look on the state of the country, look what the size of the GDP. Again, the, uh, the, the uh, Zelensky's government, they proudly announced that GDP, the, legal, uh, the illegal economy, shadow economy has dropped has dropped significantly, which is not the case. Because most analysts says that the level is the same and is dramatically high. So approximately half of the shadow half of GDP is still provided in the economy. So the structural, structural, structural handicaps are still there. Uh, even so, this uh, government tried to provide with a kind of image of being reformers and do a lot of the laws. As a matter of fact, the level of the uh, uh, reform is very low. As a matter of fact, the highest level of formation of the Ukrainian economics we have under first months of Poroshenko. And since then, it's on decline, and so far Zelensky didn't break this kind of the, of the tendency. So he made a great amount of remarks, but situation is not that much, say, good as he would present. And the last but not least, and this is exactly what I'm saying here, the economic on the rise. You see, this is the first Maidan, the second Maidan, and this is the tendency which is there. So let me just conclude with the issue. I was talking about the idiot proof countries, and I was not quite sincere, because in a sense, there are at least one institute per se, which Zelensky would could hardly destroy. This is Maidan per se. Maidan is the institute. Maidan has become the institute of the Ukrainian landscape. This is the topic which I, which is the, this is not my point, but this point made by the Osana Paschauer, the person who is probably one of the leading experts, whom I have a very high esteem. He is an economist, but also he's done a lot of commentaries. But basically, the same thing is this confirms what I'm, trying, what I'm saying here. The one institution that the land could ignore or destroy is a Maidan per se. And he understands it. He could understand it, and therefore, like we have this news today that he wants to meet with the students who are the participating of the, in the Maidan because he wants to still play with Maidan because he really understands this kind of danger. So let me just conclude with this. We don't know what really happened there, what are the chances, but the chances are still there. And since the chances are today, there, Maidan is one of red tapes that Zelensky experiences and if I am correct, the situation in Ukraine may not be that dramatic as we believe. Thank you so much. We'll have the presentation by our next speaker, Sadiq Pokin, now, and then there'll be lots of time, I think, for discussion. Sadiq Boki is the Mikhail Lushevsky Professor of Ukrainian History and the director of the Harvard uh, Ukrainian uh, the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. He has published extensively in English, Ukrainian, and in Russian. His latest book is Forgotten Bastards of the Eastern Front, American Airmen 
behind the Soviet lines and the collapse of the Grand Alliance. He's written about, he's written a novel about Mandela, he's written about Yalta, he's written all kinds of very interesting books. And uh, today, though, we're going to hear something that's very topical because, of course, we all watch, many of us, I'm sure, watch CNN and MSNBC on a regular basis where Ukraine is the first and the last and the middle item of almost every report. So it'll be interesting to hear. Sadiq. Thank you. Yes, thanks a lot for, for the invitation and for this introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, Yaroslav Ritsak did the math, it's 29 years. Actually, it was here in Edmonton that I also first met Yaroslav and for the first time heard about Lysiak Rudnitsky and the, the, the symposium on Lysiak Rudnitsky and his legacy happened yesterday. Um, so, again, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, what I am going to do uh, today is to speak about uh, Ukraine and Ukraine in the middle, in the center of impeachment, but also provide, uh, provide a broader context for that, for that story. And the broader context will be the uh, foreign policy under President Zelensky and uh, the, the uh, again, I'll, I'll talk about the United States, I'll talk about the impeachment, but there will be also Russia and France and, and Germany as part of that discussion. Well, the uh, war, uh, Rus Russo-Ukrainian war, really changed dramatically the political landscape of Ukraine. Uh, one thing that happened, that's loss of Crimea and loss of significant part of Donbass and the, mm, most, mm, the, the most populated parts of Donbass, which uh, dramatically changed the political map of Ukraine. The uh, electorate that was voting for the party of regions, which was considered to be pro-Russian, uh, was not part of the elections, presidential elections in 2014 that uh, elected uh, President Poroshenko. That electorate was also not part of the presidential elections in 2019 when um, uh, Zelensky, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky was elected as the president. And uh, despite the differences in the, in the rhetoric uh, and, and, and uh, um, career paths and personalities of the two presidents, there was something in common. Both of them were elected with overwhelming support of the, of the Ukrainian uh, electorate, which was quite a new, something that was not there in Ukraine from 1991 up until 2014. So Ukraine, as a result of the war, ended up to be much more homogenous and much more unified than it was before the war. Again, loss of the uh, potentially pro-Russian or pro-Russian electorate in Donbass and in Crimea was one factor for that. Another factor for that was, of course, the mobilization of the, um, the rest of Ukraine over the issues of sovereignty uh, and independence. And that mobilization was something that uh, President Poroshenko certainly was trying uh, very much to use in his electoral campaign. So his uh, slogan about uh, army, faith and language was there and uh, quite unique for Ukrainian recent history, he was there not to promise things but actually to uh, campaign on achievements that already happened in each of those areas. Well, he, uh, as we know, didn't get too far. Uh, max 25% of the electorate supported him. 73% supported his, uh, uh, his uh, competitor, uh, Mr. Zelensky. And uh, there is a number of explanations for that. Uh, one most obvious is, of course, the rise of the price for, for gas and, and other services. Uh, as one of the observers said, please point me one country where the prices can, can be doubled and that will not 
be, uh, um, that that will not result in the fall of a government. So in that sense, again, there is little surprise. But there is also another thing that is there and that was um, clearly uh, um, um, indicated and pointed by sociologists and sociological polls. This mobilization around the ideas of Ukrainian independence and sovereignty peaked by the year 2015 and started to go down after that. What they were replaced with was actually people were tired of the war. They wanted, they wanted uh, uh, the improved economic conditions. Uh, the big issue became, uh, became corruption. And at the end, the, the slogans, army, faith, and language were not really able to deal with this, uh, with this overall trend and, and slide in, in support for the, for the continuing military confrontation with Russia, which was one of the factors why Zelensky won. He won more or less on the same platform that uh, Poroshenko came to power in 2014, both of them, they were promising end of the war, both Poroshenko and, and Zelensky. But they clearly, uh, given uh, uh, differences in their background, understanding of the situation, the change in situation in the war, uh, in, in the country, approached the issues of war and peace in a very different way. Uh, one of the first things that happened under Poroshenko, that was, of course, military offensive. First, the, 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 the uh, mm, well, quite successful attack on the, on the uh, Russian and separatist forces uh, in, uh, uh, in the area of Donetsk airport. And then there was an offensive um, in the summer of 2014 that eventually uh, provoked Russian intervention. Now, not a covered intervention, but actually Russia sent its regular army troops into the battle and again Ilovaisk and then Minsk agreements became part of that. But again, uh, Poroshenko's solution to ending the war and bringing peace was reclaiming the Ukrainian territories by military force. Uh, Zelensky, who ran on the platform of, of bringing peace, has a very <clears throat> different, different suggestion which was supported by the absolute majority of the electorate and still provides him with overwhelming support in his, in his current foreign policy. So his peace is negotiated peace. And negotiated peace, one, one uh, particular person that he is interested in negotiating, it's of course uh, Vladimir Putin. Um, the uh, relations with Russia, the way how they were uh, formed and shaped under President Poroshenko, part of those relationships was about the uh, Normandy format, where, of course, Germany and France were part, part of those negotiations, part of Minsk Agreements 1 and then Minsk Agreement 2. But also the United States of America from the very beginning was a very important part of that story. So for Zelensky, uh, it immediately became um, a priority to secure personal relations with leaders of those countries. Uh, personal relationships in international relations in general play a very important role, but it seems like in thinking of Zelensky, they, they actually may be mar more important than in thinking of other leaders. He believes in his own power to convince people or to charm people and to make them laugh. Uh, and again, this interpersonal relations is something that is very important for him. Uh, it turned out to be actually not easy to, to get to the level of interpersonal relations and personal meetings, which were at the, at the top of his, of his list. One, uh, one leader whom he met right away and who was really very, very uh, eager to see him was uh, uh, President of France, Macron. And uh, uh, there were a number of reasons for, for, that, uh, for that welcome visit to, to Paris very early on. Macron, as we know, uh, on the one hand, continues the old French uh, policy of uh, 
stay in quite independent in international relations from the US and NATO. And uh, Macron is also trying to um, seize a, a, a moment and, and provide leadership in a situation where he uh, has an American president who is very skeptical about NATO, at least started his presidency as being very skeptical about NATO. He is pushing for the, for the idea of the creation of European armed forces. In, in, if the US is abandoning Europe as uh, one could uh, certainly uh, uh, um, uh, come to that kind of a conclusion on the basis of Trump's, of Trump's um, statements, that means and there is no military force and there is no trained force, the relationship with Russia, friendly relationship with Russia become very important for Europe as well. So that's more or less the division and the platform that Macron has there. And with uh, Zelensky's thinking about peace as a negotiated peace, uh, there, was, there was immediately a platform, a platform there. But it turned out to be much more difficult to get uh, meetings with uh, other two very important uh, leaders in, in that uh, story. Uh, one of them, of course, is Donald Trump and another is Vladimir Putin. And as we know now from the impeachment inquiry and the public hearings in, in, in the Congress, uh, meeting, personal meeting with Trump was at, at the very top of uh, President Zelensky's agenda very early on. Um, he, he was, uh, um, again, the, 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 the suggestions in that regard were coming already immediately after the presidential elections. They were there in June, they were in July, they were in August, September, and so on and so forth. So far, he didn't get what he wanted, and that's meeting with Trump not just on the margins of some forum, but the meeting in, uh, meeting in, the, in the White House. And uh, mm, there is a number of reasons why that didn't happen so far. One is um, generally uh, Trump's a very clear tendency not to offend Russia and Mr. Putin for whatever reasons. Again, the, 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 there is a number of theories that try to explain that phenomenon. And uh, then the idea that uh, the uh, European partners in NATO, that's really their business, they have to deal with that. So that was, that was part of the story. Another part of the story was, of course, that uh, Trump uh, uh, didn't treat Ukraine positively from the very beginning um, because of uh, the uh, partially at least uh, policies of uh, Poroshenko government. So uh, in the middle of the presidential campaign uh, when Manafort becomes, Paul Manafort becomes the head of the, of the presidential campaign uh, Kyiv, which means Poroshenko government leaks, um, leaks uh, um, compromat on uh, Manafort and the money that he was getting from the, from the um, uh, party of regions, uh, which leads eventually to Manafort's, uh, uh, Manafort resigning from, the, from, the, from that position but also convinces Trump that Ukraine is actually playing on the other side, on the playing uh, on, uh, and trying to support Clinton. Uh, so that's, that's uh, uh, one clear, clear uh, um, reason for, uh, again, reluctance on the part of Trump to accommodate anything coming from Ukraine, including Zelensky's requests for for uh, a meeting in the White House. Uh, continuation of the story, again, that Zelensky inherited from Poroshenko government is that after making that mistake with Trump, uh, with Manafort and Trump being elected in the White House, they're trying to continue playing American politics. So uh, uh, the uh, um, Attorney General Lutsenko is publicly attacks the uh, Masha Ivanovich, the, the, the American ambassador in Kyiv, for allegedly providing him with the list 
of people who were not supposed to be touched. So they're trying now play on the, on the uh, other side and try to get into good, into good relationship with Trump, providing, providing him uh, uh, basically services where, where uh, they believe he wants to get, to get help. They're also trying to protect themselves, Lutsenko in particular, from uh, um, clearly criticism, very serious criticism that comes from the U.S. Embassy and Ivanovich in particular regarding, uh, regarding um, uh, the, uh, um, corruption in the government that certainly, certainly was there. Uh, was it exaggerated or not? But it was, it was there, we know that for sure. So uh, Zelensky inherits, inherits uh, their quite a legacy in terms of spoiled relationships between Ukraine and, and US, which were not of his making. And uh, then he tries to do what he thinks he is the best at and basically flatter and charm Trump. And we all know that from, the, uh, from really embarrassing for any, for any American or for a, any Ukrainian conversation between the two leaders. So that's him trying to, to, to get into, into, uh, on, on good terms with Trump. Uh, the only, uh, for, the, for, for Ukrainian side, the only uh, uh, maybe consolation is that at least he is trying to ask something for his country and he is asking for military assistance. When Trump is asking for dirt on his uh, on his potential rival, which was, uh, which was Joe Biden. <clears throat> uh, a big question for me, which I, I really uh, don't know uh, answer to and, and don't know how to approach, why with that desire of uh, Zelensky to um, really accommodate Trump, he is not making and, and dragging his feet and all the way into September with the uh, announcement of the investigation into, into the uh, uh, Burisma and, and Biden, which at the end turned to be actually a very politically shrewd and right decision. Uh, by not making that, uh, that um, statement, certainly Ukraine is, an, is in a better position today in terms of relations with the United States with the Congress, then it would be otherwise. Again, I don't know why, why Zelensky turned out to be so, so um, uh, kind of a reluctant to do what Trump wanted him to do. One of the possible explanations, and again, I, I don't want to push that too far because I don't have any evidence, but that's uh, the fact that uh, uh, Zelensky comes to power backed by one of Ukrainian oligarchs Mr. Kolomoisky, who is from the very beginning on not very good terms with another Ukrainian oligarch half imprisoned in Vienna, Mr. Firtas. And of course, the people who work for uh, uh, Giuliani trying to get dirt on, on Biden, they're people who also work with Mr. Firtas. And Kolomoisky publicly already in May of this year talks about clowns that come there and, and try to, to uh, engage him in all sorts of deals and try to use him to get access to Zelensky. So again, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, it's possibly the, the relationship between the oligarchs that are partially responsible for that, but whatever is behind that, it turned out to be a very, very fortunate delay in, in any kind of announcement that saved not just face for Ukraine, but also allows Ukraine to uh, get bipartisan support in Ukrainian Congress and Ukrainian Senate, despite all the skepticism and all the hostility that comes from the White House. Um, now, let me uh, move to Russia and to another obsession of uh, Volodymyr Zelensky getting a personal meeting with uh, Vladimir Putin. 
Again, it's difficult to say why, but, but he believes in that and, and he believes in the meeting as something that is of value in its own right. So having this meeting for him is, is, is extremely important, symbolically or otherwise. And uh, um, he was uh, pushing for that meeting in the format of the, in the uh, Normandy format, that means the leaders of uh, France, Germany, uh, Ukraine, and Russia. But there is also uh, now certainly news that there can be a personal meeting between him and, and Putin on the margins of that, of that um, Normandy, uh, Normandy Forum uh, summit that is scheduled today for December 9th. So it will be within, within next 10 days and we'll see what will happen. And Putin keeps actually extracting, extracting price for, for the very possibility of meeting between Zelensky and him. And that price uh, Zelensky is prepared to pay. One of, of uh, the uh, very worrisome signals is the fact that um, the um, key witness in the uh, um, downing of the Malaysian airplane uh, Mr. Tsema was exchanged for, um, Ukraine, for Ukrainians, uh, in particular the sailors, in uh, Russian custody. So really putting Ukrainian claims and Ukrainian position in general with regard to that investigation in jeopardy. Uh, another, another worrisome signal is certainly the, what is happening with the Security Council which originally was led by Mr. Daniluk, who is, again, we, we are expecting him at Harvard on December, uh, on December 3rd. Uh, and uh, there is a lot, a lot of good things to be, to be said about Mr. Daniluk, but he is not a security expert. His, his, his previous background is in economics and, and uh, in, in uh, again, he, he, he played a very important and positive role in uh, the story of Privat Bank before that. So, but again, that's, that's the, he's not an expert on, on security issues. Uh, the, uh, the appointment of another uh, comedian, uh, Mr. Sivoho, as a key figure in the Security Council also sends a signal that the president doesn't treat this, this institution very seriously. And uh, the most recent news that came from Kyiv, the uh, um, uh, fact that uh, uh, Olena Zerkal, the, the, deputy, the deputy foreign minister of Ukraine, is stepping down, a person who really produced a miracle uh, in terms of the, um, um, presenting the, 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 the case, Ukrainian legal case, on the issue of the Russian violation of the rights of Ukraine in the Azov Sea and Black Sea, the, the, the uh, issue of the uh, support and financing of terrorism, which meant really the, the book uh, uh, missile that, that, that shut down the, the Malaysian airplane. Okay, all of that are quite, quite worrisome, quite worrisome signals. And uh, <clears throat> the, the uh, Going into the, into the Normandy format meetings, uh, it's very difficult to say what, what uh, Mr. Zelensky is counting on. Uh, certainly the, the U.S., uh, given what is going on, uh, the U.S. is really busy now with impeachment. Uh, people who otherwise maybe would be working on, on behalf of Ukraine are simply busy with something that is more important politically for Washington at that, at that time. We know more or less where Mr. Macron stands, and again, there are tensions and growing tensions between France and Germany. So uh, we don't know much about German positions, but that's, that's the, only, the only hope for Ukraine and for Zelensky. Uh, uh, we, we, we have little choice but to wait until December the 9th and to see what is, what is the game plan because as Yaroslav Retsak just mentioned, this group of people are very disciplined in terms of uh, uh, staying on the message and also not, they're not leaking. So this is not Trump's White House. Uh, that's, that's a much more, much more disciplined 
much more disciplined operation. Another big, big uh, date in December to look at and watch would be, um, I, I'm not sure either it's December 17th or December 19th, but that can be checked. The Ukrainian court will have to decide on the issue of Privat Bank, which is a big question about Zelensky and, and the uh, war on corruption, how, how serious he is about that. Um, so December in many ways will, uh, if will not be decisive months in terms, of, uh, in, in terms of Ukrainian foreign policy and peace agenda of President Zelensky, at least it will send some very clear signals of where, where his thinking is, what, what his expectations are, and whether he is getting or not getting what he, what he wants. And uh, I will conclude that with something that is not related to Zelensky directly, but is closely related with something that I started my presentation with, and that's the changed landscape, including political landscape of Ukraine, which as a result of the war created a more homogenous society, a society in which there is no any more split 50-50 like it was Yushchenko, uh, um, Yanukovych, or Timoshenko, uh, Yanukovych, but where there is a clear majority that is emerging. The majority can change its opinion where to go, but there is a majority. There was majority behind Poroshenko, there was, there, there was and still is a clear majority behind Zelensky. Uh, whatever our conditions, whether it's Stonemeyer formula or not, for bringing back Donbass, Donbass, if it comes back with actually full civil rights and rights to vote, will dramatically change the map, electoral map of Ukraine and have, have an impact also on that, on that level of homogeneity that, that uh, Ukraine had achieved in the, in the last few years, which again is something to keep in mind in terms of the, of the uh, um, general agenda for peace and negotiation of the peace and reintegration of the, of the lost territories. Uh, so on this uh, note, I'll, I'll conclude my presentation and hopefully I can be more optimistic in my answers to the questions that you asked, but please try to ask more optimistic questions. <laughs> Thanks. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, clearly there is no reason for uh, Putin to, to compromise. The world is moving in more or less in the direction he wants to move. It to move. Uh, the, uh, the re there is a chaos in Europe with Brexit and UK living. There is a growing conflict between France and Germany. And there is a U.S. president who doesn't think that U.S. has to be involved too much in Ukraine or in Eastern Europe. Uh, and uh, he is moving ahead also with the uh, project of uh, reintegration of Belarus into what was the Soviet space or post-Soviet space. There can be a political, a political uh, uh, domestic political agenda there as well, in a sense that that would allow him to circumvent the current Russian constitution and become the leader of the of the new uh, of the new unified state. 
But whatever the, the domestic the domestic reasons for him doing that, there is a clear clear foreign policy implication. He moves closer into into the center of Europe. Ukraine gets really Russia not only on its eastern border but also on its northern border. So I don't see any reason for Putin to, to compromise and not try to get maximum of what he wants. And what you just said in terms of the statements made by the separatist puppet governments there, they, they, they don't make decisions on their own. They certainly just reproduce what they get in Moscow. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a very worrisome situation. I agree with you. Luxi? Short comments, especially to uh, numbers of like Zelensky voters, like the three percent. Uh, I would say that uh, it reflects not only a clear uh, group of supporters of Zelensky, but rather it reflects kind of a main conflict in Ukraine, which is between actually Ukrainian society and political voters. And majority of voters of Zelensky actually voted for him. Uh, not only because of like him, but mainly against again against of Poroshenko, etc., etc., and it reflects this uh, approach towards political class, which is quite united despite of some uh, internal contradictions. But I would not overestimate his support uh, right now. We have already like near 50, 52 percent as uh, uh, last uh, research. Of support of his policy. But my question is, uh, unfortunately, not so optimistic. It's more about the fate of Donbass. So how would you really expect the possibility of this reintegration? And what, in your opinion, actually the best scenario in realistic time for Ukraine at this moment in the dealing with this Donbass issue? Okay. To your co comment, to your comment, uh, the real problem of, of uh, Zelensky is that he has no core electorate, and he knows it. If if things come worse to worse, he no, he, he knows he has nobody to rely on. Unlike Poroshenko, because Poroshenko has clearly cut core electorate, which is not the case with Zelensky. So this is something which has to be taken into 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 account. As to Donbas. This bus per se uh, under, undergoes uh, dramatic change, trans, deep transformation. There is no single bus nowadays. You know that, that in bus as a region falls apart. And not just occupied, non-occupied territory, but there's different setting nowadays. The north of Donbass claim it's not Donbass anymore, it's part of Bozhanshchina. The south of Donbass claim it's a Azovsky region. They don't want to be Donbass, there's something going on. And there is not one republic, but two republics, Donetsk and Luhansk which tells you something as well. I, I met Slovak journalist, Tomasz Foro, who was uh, in Donetsk two years. For two years, he was pretending to be a Russian supporter. And he f managed to flee at the moment when he was like uh, discovered, revealed. So he went to, to Slovakia and he managed to write a book. The book is now a translation, but he put me some main points. Basically says that, that is regarding what we say, there is a very strong, how should I put it, not dislike, so I, I like the words, but disappointment with Russia in Donbass. Because they feel they haven't been betrayed by Putin. Because they very much counted on not just on the support of the Putin, that they will be led into Russia right after beginning of the cloth. It never happened. Which basically put it from the day sick and tired of the war. They want to return to normal state. And normal for them is Ukraine of 2013. So they want to return to Ukraine. And this is the growing. Also, he says basically this Thomas Soro that it's now for me was amazing the last month of his stay in Donetsk. He has quite frequently heard Ukrainian language. And his girlfriend, who pretended to be Russian, at the final man revealed that he was Ukrainian as well. But basically, he says they see Ukraine as a norm but Ukraine without Poroshenko. In this, um, in this sense, Zelensky is much more acceptable for them than it used to be before. So they are ready to return. 
this probably sounds paradoxical, but this is what they say. And basically, there is some, 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 some surveys done. Specifically, I want to uh, turn your attention to the study that was done by, uh, I forgot the name, the, who's now in Leipzig, director of Zippo. Gwendolyn Sasse. 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 She made several surveys in the occupied zone, which basically confirmed the same tendency which was saying. So they just seek the entire new war. It's nothing really kind about Russia and Ukraine. They want to run normality. And they see normality as Ukraine, but Ukraine of 213. So there's a chance they may return. If they will return, that's exactly what would, uh, said he would say. It would change dramatically political landscape and opposition or regional, regional, region, regional get their core again. Back so the thing. So, so I am not uh, nowadays uh, have a kind of the kind of advisor, be advisor, unlike to the previous power, because I was an expert with Poroshenko. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not denying that. Uh, but still, in our understanding, the best case is to freeze situation, to keep it freeze as far as possible. Because if nowadays Donbass will get back in Ukraine, it's not just like a kind of geopolitical, mm -hmm. which is very important, but also it will jeopardize chance for Ukrainian reforms. Because slowly but still, surely there are some reforms. And this would happen, I believe, that Ukraine would finally lose a chance with reforming of the country. He's in charge. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned that Zelensky was campaigned on uh, a negotiated peace with Putin. Is there, does he have any chance of success to do this as long as Trump is in the White House? Well, uh, I, I, I think that uh, he certainly has the chances to, to have peace. Uh, the big question is what kind of peace and whose conditions. Uh, but uh, again, in terms of uh, 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 if he meets the conditions of Putin, uh, Putin certainly is able of stopping fire on the on the on the front line and and withdrawing forces and so on and so forth. They they completely control both uh, separatist republics. The, uh, those leaders who were uh, these warlords that were there, charismatic people who led that revolt and that uprising, by now is either exiled or most of them are actually shot. So the people who are running the show are uh, completely take their orders from, from Moscow. So Putin clearly can deliver peace if he gets what he wants and if uh, Mm, Zelensky prepared to give whatever Putin wants, yes, there will be peace. The, 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 the question is... But I guess whether, whether it be a, a peace that would be palatable in, in Ukraine. Yeah, uh, well, the, 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 uh, mm, what is interesting about generally Russian foreign policy and, and Putin in particular, uh, they are relatively open about what they want. And they can say that publicly, but uh, people just don't believe that this is this is real. So there was Putin's speech in Munich. Then there was uh, a, a number of other speeches. What they wanted immediately after Crimea was the federalization of Ukraine, with each of the regions having veto power over Ukrainian foreign policy. And I don't think that there is much departure from from that from that agenda overall. So if they get if they get that kind of Donbass in Ukraine with either formal or informal power to stop uh, Ukrainian movement toward the West and uh, secure Ukraine as part of the Russian sphere of influence, I, I think that's, that's the agenda. If they're getting that, the, uh, uh, Zelensky can get what he wants if that's what he wants. <clears throat> In going into negotiations, you have to look at the respective bargaining powers. And in March 2014, Zelensky said he would go on his knees to Putin. He showed himself to be a weakling. Recently, uh, uh, 
Komoyski had an article in the New York Times in which he said, well, we have to move back towards Russia. And again, that weakens Ukrainians' bargaining position. Not that they had a strong one to start with. Germany is in a conflict of interest. They want the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, and they're going to cave to Putin. Macron is basically a, a reincarnation of uh, Vichy France, collaboration with, uh, with, with Russia. And Trump is the soulmate of Putin. So Ukraine basically stands on its own, except for maybe the countries of the intermarried. So I'm not optimistic about what happens on December 9th. And on December 13th, they're supposed to finalize a gas contract. So I don't know who organizes these time frames. It's got to be the Kremlin, because how do you go into a negotiation, and then a few days later, you have to have a gas contract, which Ukraine obviously will want. Uh, so I'm not optimistic. But you have the movement, Ni Kapitulatsi. Uh, if, if Zelensky capitulates, will there be another Maidan? And are there forces in Ukraine that can stand up to Zelensky? Uh, I think Poroshenko has sort of lost his appeal and ability to make a comeback, or maybe he hasn't, I don't know, but I, he probably has. Are there forces in Ukraine that can lead a resistance to the capitulation? Is there leadership that can perform that function? For this kind of revolution, which is a saying, there is no need for leadership. Look at the Arabic Spring. There has been no leaders. Look at the second Maidan. The leads were very just formal Maidan. They were mocked on the Maidan. Because basically, this is a new type. It's mobilization from below. Uh, rephrasing your, your question, yes, there will be definitely resistance if Zelensky would go too far in the, this negotiation. He, affair, he, is a, he is aware of that. And it exactly returns to the question, because he knows there is the core. And the core is 25 It's a lot in Ukraine because they can make the go to the street, which is unlike, 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 this is say Poroshenko, most likely the support of Zelensky would never transform itself in political actions. So therefore, I would say, I would end with Zelensky because given his internal situation, his space of maneuver is relatively uh, limited. But I mean, internationally, it's quite a different issue. So basically, referring to your question, yes, it's very much possible. And I believe, at least I know, at least I know that Zelensky is very much aware of this kind of the scenario in Ukraine. If I may ask a question then. Um, Zelensky, I mean, who is he? Is he, a, is he a political actor? Is he just an actor playing politics? I mean, what is his relationship with Kolomoisky? Who, you know, who is, who is, guiding him or advising him that, that's uh, shaping his foreign policy in particular. Do we have any sense of that? No, I can start. And, yeah. I have some additional information then. Probably. Okay, sure. Uh, well, uh, a short answer is I don't know. And a longer answer that I, I, I can speculate. Well, one thing is obvious that uh, he, is, uh, he turned out to be a very gifted politician. Uh, it's uh, again expecting, expecting from someone who spent career um, on, on the on the on the scene and and being basically a Ukrainian version of stand-up comic, and built a business around that to to win elections, and then to run this quite tight ship in terms of people, people around him. You need, you need skills. Uh, another, another thing that uh, he surprised me <clears throat> very positively. 
he <coughs> built up a, or allowed others to build a quite interesting group of people in the uh, cabinet of ministers and in, in the government. Mm -hmm. They're young ones, they're mm -hmm. ambitious, they're new liberals, so at the end with their reforms probably there will be an explosion at the end, but they're actually trying honestly to do reforms that, uh, as uh, uh, Yaroslav shown, started in the first year, year and a half of Poroshenko and then were abandoned for political reasons. So uh, th th these guys are picking up exactly where, where they left or the previous generation left. And so far it seems to me he's quite, quite effectively keeps an umbrella above them and protects them from the oligarchs, in particular Kolomoisky. The, the real answer how effective that is will be later in the months when, when there will be issue uh, dealing with, uh, again, the court will decide, will be de deciding on the issues of, of private bank. Uh, so th 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 this are actually pluses and he does what Poroshenko just didn't do in the last, in the last two years of his, of his government. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so he is, he is learning very fast. Mm -hmm. uh, so th th this, these are things that are there that very few people expected. I, I expected from him, like many others, to be basically a, a, a form of Yushchenko at some, at some stage, Bas doing his own stuff that, that he liked to do, his pet projects. But the issues, the, the big issues, really decided by people around him and, and quite corrupt people around him. Uh, Zelensky turned out, while we are talking about this, uh, the, the, the model of some authoritarian form of regime or something like that, which is again unheard of in Ukraine. So th there is a lot of political, political talent there. Uh, the question is what, what will come out of that, how long his luck will last. So the, 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 there is a lot of questions, but so far he surprised uh, quite a few people, not just by winning the elections, but also by some of the elements of his, of his politics. And while some issues in terms of the foreign policy were surprisingly, were surprising on the on the kind of a negative side, certain things that are being done in economics are positively surprising. I would pick up where uh, Serhii just uh, finished. I, I do agree completely that you could not neglect Zelensky, you could ignore him. He's very gifted and hardworking personality. And so far, so far, he hasn't committed any major mistake. Even in context of the, mm -hmm. his relations with uh, Trump, has been noted by many. The harm was very minimal in his understanding, and given his previous background, it's kind of amazing, so to say. So uh, 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 initially, I mean, you probably know that it was not quite clear, even half a year before the election, who would be in the competition a part of Yulia Tomashenko. Poroshenko was not clear himself. Poroshenko made the decision in the final moment because the main reason was his state of health. His state of health is very poor, as a matter of fact. So actually, he knew that he realized that he was afraid. Uh, Zelensky, idea of Zelensky came very late. I would guess somehow by the summer of 18, end of summer. And I know this for sure, it's a leak, but leak, very short leak, that in September 1918, Poroshenko tried to negotiate, try, try, try negotiate, to negotiate with, uh, with uh, Kolomoisky. Because this for the first time when Zelensky appeared on the landscape as a possible candidate. So the, the main strategy of Poroshenko was uh, competition with Tymoshenko. And also the slogan, Armia Vira i uh, Mova, was the slogan for Tymoshenko because they realized, they realized that the main competing ground will be Western Ukraine. So this was designed specifically. I know but it's very cynical design, as a matter of fact, because they thought this Tymoshenko. And the appearance of Zelensky changed all the plans. So there were negotiations with Kolomoisky to remove Zelensky from the election process to which 
Коломойский put very direct and say it in Russian. Это будет мой мальчик и моя девочка. You got the picture here. It be Tomashenko and Zelensky at the final tour. So actually what, what Poroshenko did was kind of miracles that he managed to come to the second tour. Because of the odds that he will never come. So now the problem is, what the relation between Kolomoisky and Zelensky? Because at that time, clearly, he was a puppet. There was no doubt about that. And we know what really planned was this kind of just revenge, whatever it is, but still the point was that. And I believe that somehow Kolomoisky miscalculated as well, because he didn't realize that Zelensky would be real, become a real president. Not what you have to do with this. Uh, you know that uh, Kolomoisky has a very weak point. And he stands, I'll say, trial, whatever. Mm -hmm. he has a pro but he's under investigation. He's investigation by, 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 by FBI, so far as I know. Very much like a Firtash, because laundering of the money. And therefore, he is hiding himself in Israel for a long time. And then he managed to come to Ukraine under Zelensky, because this is a clear message that he is not afraid that, that Zelensky would deliver him to the United States. What the relation between them is not clear. But there is one point. The point is Prat Bank. Because this is the, the most probably serious red, red tape nowadays, which is put by IMF. If the Zelensky got Prat Bank back, back, IMF would stop the support for Ukraine. And if you heard the news yesterday, IMF left Kyiv yesterday without no deal. Which means Kolomoisky still impact, exerts some power. So the situation is totally unclear. So actually, as I say, it's probably the same result. That we will see the result in December, mm -hmm. what will be the decision of private bank. But we have to watch closely the issue of private bank because it tells you the basic thing. Whether Zelensky is trying to put, move out of the shadow of Kolomoisky or he will stay within the shadow. So we, we say that he was clever. He did stall, but he was two days before making the statement that Trump wanted, right? So, I mean, in the way he's very fortunate, he was going to already uh, had organized with CNN to go on. And, he was going to capitulate. And capitulate, right? So in, in a way, he, he, he stalled for a considerable amount of time, but it, it was the good fortune of the whistleblower or some part of the whistleblower that stopped from going on to Fareed Zakaria and making the statement that Trump wanted. So I think in one way we can't give him too much credit because he had capitulated by September and, and it was only, only good fortune that stopped him from, uh, from doing it. Uh, but uh, uh, maybe go to Washington and thoughts of what, I mean, we are seeing in the a revolt by the, the, the bureaucracy, deep state, diplomatic service against the Trump government, the dismantling of American foreign policy, uh, and uh, a very uncertain election. And now Zelensky has to decide. He's got Trump for a while and a somewhat wounded Trump. Of course, the Democratic Party has never sounded so not only pro-Ukrainian, but even uh, patriotically uh, allied when Ukraine becomes our ally daily on the Demo Democrats' news. So how is he going to then go between these two? Uh, that is, not knowing which way the election comes out. Uh, I mean, uh, we will see. I'm still in, in, in shock that the U.S. can unravel at the rate it seems to be unraveling. Uh, obviously, we're a bit worried in Canada with the new foreign minister whether uh, this also is a sign that Canada is going to have to reposition itself uh, and deal with at least Russia at the Arctic. But maybe since you produce, so he has contacts with, uh, goes down to Washington, is there anything you can see in the contacts between these two parties and where he goes? Well, um, <clears throat> regarding Lackey, Lackey is part of politics, right? So uh, uh, he, he Stalled for three months yeah, when, he, three when months. he wanted he, that he for, for, for whatever for whatever yeah, reason, yeah. and it didn't happen. Yeah. So he stalled right enough not to get into yeah. 
into a bigger trouble and uh, Poroshenko left him a mess there. So that's, that's uh, in terms of luck and yeah, you need luck sometimes. So he, he got lucky by one day, two days, but again, he, he didn't do the damage that he could do. Uh, regarding what, what will happen next will very much depend on the outcome of the, of the um, uh, hearings. Uh, so far there is uh, bipartisan support for uh, Ukraine, which is very important. So far is basically the Congress is there probably sto uh, stopping by the end of the year uh, introducing sanctions regarding the uh, North Stream 2, which is, again, is in American interest, but is very much in the, in the Ukraine interest. Uh, it can change. Zelensky can, can do all sorts of mistakes, uh, run out of luck, there can be changes in, 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 in U.S. as well. So we don't know, but so far the, 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 the alliance is, is, is holding on. And uh, the alliance is holding on partially because uh, whether you are Republican or you are Democrat, you, you don't agree really with Trump's foreign policy. So Trump is, is, is holding that alliance together. If he would be gone, I, I think that bipartisan support would, would probably will be, will be not there, would be reconfigured. But uh, yeah, I, I can't, I can't, I can't predict, and, and I don't think uh, any, anyone can do that again. It's, uh, we, we are in a very difficult situation, very dangerous one. So. Uh. If the people who are who don't speak in, uh, Ukrainian don't mind, you know, the DAP is fit and you're full green, you must have put a lot of green. Yes. No. We, we'll translate to each other. Unless <laughs> 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 please. In terms of the um, homogeneity of the electorate, as you said, it's um, might be worth clarifying because in terms of the percentage it was the percentage of voters for Zelensky that was apparently so high. But if you take the number of voters, uh, it, has, it has gone down with every election, every presidential election since independence. So it was almost down to 50% um, voter participation. So if you look at it that way, then the, the, it's not so homogenous in practice. Well, it's, it's, it's all in comparison, yeah. so it's, it's much more homogenous than it was before. And in terms of the, how active the electorate is, there is a difference between, between 2014 and 2019 mm -hmm. elections. Again, the 2014, the East was demoralized. They were not, they were not and, and the, the West and the Center were really uh, motivated. With, with uh, uh, Poroshenko Zelensky elections, it's the other way around. So mm -hmm. the, the, that situation changing. But again, it's all, it's all in comparison. And in terms of the voters' participation, also comparison is really very important. So uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine is the country where the participation is relatively high compared to, 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 to other countries. So uh, uh, I, would, I would probably speak here about the tendency. And uh, my big surprise was that the majority, again, was there in 2019. I thought that that was kind of a particular moment of mobilization in 2014 because of the threat, because of the war, because of the loss of the territories. But it looks like that the map that was produced by that shock somehow produces the majority, produced at least in, in, in this elections. We can talk uh, here about tendency. It, maybe it will not. It will not be there in, in, in for, for the next presidential elections. And if if Donbass is there and with full vo vo voting rights, yeah, I, I think there will be there will be re re redrawing of the map. I was looking at the political geography recently. I was studying it. So basically, you yeah, there is probably level homogeneity is overrated, but still it is there. 
if not judging by the just political elections, the result election, because election, every election is kind of political crisis, wouldn't be counted. On normal, but as we see on a normal basis, there were several consensuses which were not there before. And was this consensus in the Holdemar, without a doubt, there is an overall national consensus on the Holdemar as a genocide. Yes. East and West, this is this. There is, uh, there is uh, overall uh, consensus on the status of Ukrainian language. There's no doubt about that. There is general consensus on the, uh, whatever they mean depends on the West orientation of the country, not Russia, but West. And most importantly, probably the most uh, uniting factors at in Putin attitudes. At Donbass or not, Crimea or not, but the major changes, so dramatic changes, how Putin was perceived before, Maidan after Maidan. Before Maidan, Putin considered very positively. Now, after Maidan, after Maidan, after the war, Putin is the most disliked person in Ukraine, and this is general consensus. Okay, so this is level of the dislike may vary, but this is there. So what I would say there is certain, there is more homogeneity. Used to be four. Part of this is because there is no Donbass and Crimea, but part also because of the war, because it's still this kind of mobilized, mobilized society. Church of Ukraine. Um, one understands that, of course, the sort of machinations of, of Putin behind Kirill and so on. But how much of that struggle for the Orthodox space or, uh, can be read as a, a proxy struggle for the geopolitics? Or is it a sideshow and Putin isn't taking it seriously, just letting them all have their little, their little day, their showdown with Alexandria and so on? Can you say something about the salience of the church issue? Well, uh, I think you're sitting next to the biggest yeah. expert in the room on that, on that particular <laughs> issue. So I don't know, Frank, do you want to comment? I, I can comment, but I'm sure you, you, you actually have yeah, a much I, better, much I better feel. Better, better so I think that uh, Putin did treat this seriously. I think uh, that Kirill has not delivered and, and is in trouble. I think obviously we were talking about timing, the timing that uh, the Zelensky didn't go on to read Zakaria by a few days, he lucked out, but of course the timing of when the Tomos went through and what Poroshenko needed turned out to be the only time it could be done. I mean, could we picture it being done now? Would Erdogan ever permit it? The Tomos today, you know, given the situation with, with the switch on it. I, I mean, from what I can see, uh, the, at least, it, it, there can be some thought that, that uh, Putin has uh, not interested, but we get reports, for example, that when the Georgian bishops, or, or the contact with the Georgian bishops, Putin intervenes and tries to read the, read the riot act for uh, what they're doing in Georgia. So, uh, I mean, it seems to be still part of somewhat Russian policy. I just wonder what what Kirill's future is going to be now that this has not worked out. And of course, the, the, uh, the amazing thing is the replication of hybrid war in the church. I mean, uh, who would ever think that the Russians would come up with a conceptualization that we will deal with those bishops who, of the Church of Greece who don't mention the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. I mean, they, they, you know, they, it, it's an interesting, I think parallel is sophistication that they've now decided that they can't pull the whole church in Greece, so they will try and pull some of the bishops. But obviously, the uh, the Alexandrian one uh, is going to be a major loss. And uh, the uh, the other link, I went down to Washington and uh, uh, so we couldn't be at a, a con conference that was organized by the Berkeley Institute that Jose Casanova heads. And I think we are very fortunate that the Greek Orthodox are well organized politically. That is, the archaeons that support the Constantinople Patriarchate have some political links in the, in the US Congress. Uh, and uh, so it was clear, although that Washington keeps announcing that it had no policy, it seems to have had a, a policy to support the ecumenical patriarchate in this. Um, so, yeah. I read a report that Kirill is going to be proclaiming himself as the ecumenical patriarch because mm -hmm. the, the other one is disgraced and in heresy mm -hmm. and so they're just going to start presenting him as the ecumenical patriarch. Rome, right? Yeah. So they've, they've, 
realize their ambition too. So, uh, could I ask a question? Well, could you comment on Putin and or Russia domestically? Like, what's going on in Russia domestically? Do you think that might have some impact, if any, in uh, what's going on in the larger uh, neighborhood with Ukraine? I can start. I mean, you can start. Yeah, I'll, I'll start, and, and, uh, and uh, Yaroslav will, will, will uh, continue. And uh, one thing that is happening there, certainly, Putin is not prepared to leave the, the Kremlin, whether it's uh, uh, the repetition of the situation that uh, was there with um, uh, Medvedev or any, it looks like he, he will stay as long as he can. And uh, he can stay for a long period of time in today's Russia. They survived uh, the most difficult uh, period uh, with sanctions, with low oil price. They had a very, very successful monetary policy. So this is a generation of Putin and people around him who emerged from the um, um, financial meltdown of 1998 and learned a lesson. So they handled on the, on the financial side the, the, the downturn and the crisis quite well. So my understanding is that the Russian economy is recovering after, after uh, that, that, that period. That being said, so from that point of view, I don't foresee any, any major, major uh, changes in, in the immediate future. On the other hand, this is also the regime with an uh, aging and on a certain level tied leader, who certainly is not prepared to uh, introduce any structural reforms, like it happened during the first term of uh, Putin as the president. So we are probably looking at the Russian economy as uh, maybe growing, but mostly in, in, the, in the stagnation kind of a category. There are structural things that don't, uh, will not allow them to grow really fast. There are uh, foreign policy issues because of his foreign policy that will limit his access to the, uh, and limit already access to new technology, which is needed also to get oil and gas out, out of uh, the ground. So um, my, my uh, prediction is that they will be more of the same and, and uh, probably for a relatively long period of time. Uh, there is also in Russia uh, appearing a new generation which, uh, again, we, we saw that with, with youngsters demonstrating there, for whom the, the argument that works for the previous generation doesn't work. And that argument was that Putin saved them from the 1990s, from the poverty of the 1990s, from the uh, high level of criminality where you couldn't walk on the streets and so on and so forth. And for that, for that stability, they're supposed to be uh, thankful to him and grateful. The, the, um, uh, the, the, the potential that was there with mobilizing nationalism and that happened around Crimea, his, his support went through the roof, is also quite limited. So the legitimacy of that regime is, is, will, will be questionable. And the, the, the strong economic growth that was before that is probably it would be difficult to replicate. So this, uh, this, this factors will be contributing to some kind of a hard landing along the line, uh, just in the future. But again, I don't, I don't think that that kind of future arrives within the next year or two. Just a minor comment. I do agree completely with what Sergei was said, but there is a minor point on this agreement, rather, that uh, if talking about generation, and this, I believe, is very much crucial difference between Russia and Ukraine. There has been no generation change in Russia in terms of the values attitudes. What Putin did manage to reproduce the older and middle generation in the younger generation, talking about 25 and 35. 
this will be rather supported by many surveys that these young people, they feel more or less the same way. They have different mm -hmm. legitimacy, mm -hmm. for sure, but they still very much kind of, Putin could rely on them, so to say. So what, it doesn't mean that there is no generational change, but this is expected with the youngest. At least if you know Dmitry Bekel, who just recently made his speech in, in Kiev, he made this kind of probably, we may expect with the now who's teenagers, which are younger. That said, which means that Putin still have uh, some window to go of opportunity for some about 10 or 15 years, because mostly have a still very much loyal, loyal support among this population. In, in the 20s and 30s. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so far as you probably noticed that if you, there's kind of comparison, safest way to compare Putin regime with the Brezhnev regime. Mm -hmm. That sense. Um, I have a question about the Ukrainian domestic, uh, Zelensky's state on Ukrainian domestic politics. Spe uh, specifically, I'm interested in the area of culture. Has his government made any serious decisions um, that affect culture? And if so, could this be a catalyst perhaps for the third Maidan that Professor Hitzak mentioned? So language policies, for example, anything that relates to broadcast and television, culture, and also Zelensky as a cultural figure is also quite known in Russia, right? He participated in one of those major shows in Russia. So um, is this playing against him or for him? I wonder if one of you could address this. So you will start now. Mm. I'll, I'll continue. It's Brechach, Pete Brechach. I'm going to So uh, I forgot the name. Borodyansky is now Minister of Culture. So what I heard about him, of him, that he's better than could be expected. So to say, because basically he was tabula rasa, has no expertise, but he's self-taught, and he's, he's taught, say, in, in positive direction. I know some of his, uh, let's say, Radniki advisors, and they tell me, especially on the church issues, he's that much progressing in very, say, positive direction from which, which, we, which we started. Uh, their ideas was initially not to touch humanitarian issues at all, just to leave it blank, so say, frozen, because they know it's explosive to say it doesn't look what they say. Nowadays, I know Wood is consulting Zelensky on this issue, and he doesn't clearly say any kind of statement, but at least when talking about the Ministry of Culture, there is a, some space for uh, optimism. Unlike the other ministry, they're trying to, some to, uh, to attract the experts, unlike they have the talks of properties, but they didn't know what this kind of real sphere uh, influence of this, of, this, of, this, of this ministry. Yeah, I, I, can, I can maybe add, again, uh, that's, that's also the kind of signals that I'm, I, I'm getting, including from Borodyansky himself. You know him? <laughs> well, I, 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 I had a short telephone conversation mm -hmm. with him, but... Um, the, the, my impression is that there is a much more continuity on, on all these issues of uh, language, history, and, and religion than there are differences. Uh, again, it can change tomorrow, but at this point, that's so they, they, they keep the Institute of National Memory. Uh, they uh, now, it looks like, on, on the issue of religion, they declared. Uh, Unvalid or something like that. The, the competition for the job that was there, but who was running there? The old, the old uh, head of that department and the person who allegedly is the the uh, really the front from Novinsky and the the really Russian Orthodox Church influences. So they want to change people. But uh, uh, overall, in terms of the policy on, on language and, and religion and history, there is a continuation. Uh, so that's, that's at least the situation today. Yeah. Um, like next year, there will be a regional election to local self-government. And uh, are there any signs, like, like, will the Zelensky party serve to the people who, you know, participate in those elections? And what chances do they have on, to gain power and uh, also on the local level? Because we see, like, 
the first time in Ukrainian history like one party uh, government but here it, uh, but also there was another interesting dimension that they managed to put in this you know local constituencies people with you know no previous political background who own uh, in, in those constituencies just being associated with the party or performed really well so can it be you know then transform to success on the local level next year and more consolidation of power I know so I start because I know the situation my friend is is kind of competing rival for the for the for the position in the local administration on the regional on the rayon level she tells me story he keeps me informed so to say so the, I believe this is one of the again the setback of Zelensky probably he's the major flow nowadays a major failure failure so far he did they didn't manage him or they didn't manage to get sufficient support on this level so there's everything is frozen because basically he announced that by the end of the by the end of the summer the most opposition will be filled it never happened until now they're still going through the process that said which is very important they introduce some kind of process the candidates they're supposed to go through some exams which is computer-based exams, anonymous, all the kind of thing. There's real competition, there's a list, all the kind of thing. Not a Facebook style like it was before, this competition. But even so, within this competition, there's always some, some kind of support. This is the Kumisto, all the kind of one thing it is. But basically, basically, this is the weakest, one of his weakest points nowadays. Because there is nobody who could really rely on the local basis. And also, he is, he is perfectly aware that this local basis will be probably even more corrupted than the upper base, because what you could get from the locality, so to say. So one way or another, this is a very touchy issue for him. Um, I have a question. What would your advice be for the diaspora here? Um, we have our own murks and squabbles internally, but uh, most of us are interested in what's happening in Ukraine and how do you think we could be most effective? Well, I can't advise myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've recently spent a lot of time there, though. Yeah, yeah there is there. Money. <laughs> <laughs> Funds. I know, I know, I know the story. I'm mean, not so serious, so jokingly, but the thing is, I don't really believe how could you affect uh, the Zelensky administration. It's not Kuchma, so to say. They feel relatively strong, and they have another channels to get to the Trump, bypassing the diaspora, the kind of things. They feel the firm's very independent in this sense. So therefore, I don't believe may, you may have some impact on this uh, ruling party, sort of, if, you, if I may use this word. But uh, this might, again, it might be fantasy, but I believe that uh, a revolution doesn't work in Ukraine. Evolution works. If this is the tr if this is the truth, then we have to say this is Ukraine, so it's called style country, not a spring country. It's a long-term change. So you have to invest in long term. In the institution. Exactly, because it's a, it's a it's a not ideal proof country. You have to build institutions. But if you build institutions, look at the new initiative platforms which are there. Specifically, I would call for specifically, if you see it, his Ukrainian Academy Leaders, UL. This is the very interesting project, which is expanding, very dynamic, and it's exactly targeted of raising of new generation of Ukrainian leaders. And they're really doing a very good job. And they cover all Ukraine nowadays. And say, so, no, I'm not because I was part of this. And then you have to invest into the platforms especially the platforms with deal with education of young people. And this will be the, my, my guess. Yeah, I, I, I certainly and second through that. Through our influence on our government? Oh, yeah, without a doubt, because most, let's, I know this wall things, they depend very much on the investments from the government sponsored structure in the West, like in Israel. As a matter of fact, Israel support them very much. It's kind of paradoxical, so to say. And I know the leader of this organization, director, has spent a lot of time in the United States in, in Canada trying to reach the, the, this kind of the government level. I mean, government level funds, which are provided by government. Do you know? I think this will be the last question. There's a major NATO conference coming up, and Ukraine is the 
decided not to send an official high-powered observer mission where Georgia is sending one. The only Ukrainian involvement is apparently Pristaiko is supposed to attend uh, some yeah, According to Hiroshinko's uh, post on Facebook, yes, Pristaiko <laughs> is coming. Uh, he's going just to, to some subcommittee meeting. So is this stance that Ukraine took, is it sort of sucking up to Putin or not wanting to alienate him? And can you offer any comments on Pristaiko and how he will compare to Klimkin? Um, well, uh, that's, that's another worrisome sign to be added to the list that I provided before, like the unprofessional uh, Security Council and, and uh, uh, exchange of Tsemakh for, for uh, Ukrainian prisoners. Uh, uh, so clearly that's, that's uh, a move, in my opinion, to assure that the uh, coveted meeting with Putin in, on December 9th takes place. Again, that's, that's my guess. I, I, I don't have any, any, any particular information. And then the second part was... Pistaiko, can you comment on uh, or how we make Well, uh, my, my, my reading, and again Slavko maybe knows something more specific and more, my understanding is that both they are professional diplomats, uh, both under Poroshenko and under uh, Zelensky, the foreign policy is not decided in the foreign ministry. Yeah, exactly. It is decided in the presidential administration yeah. and they are there to implement whatever policy was decided for them. So they are they're, they're not independent players mm. which uh, Maybe, maybe is not, not such a bad thing in general that at least the, the entire country is on the same page. Maybe we don't like the page, but that's. Well, thank you very much, both our speakers this, uh, this evening, uh, for a very interesting, wide ranging conversation about uh, issues that are very much in the news today and very much in our thoughts here. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'll see you at home.